वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स टू लेक्चर नंबर सेवेंटीन सो टूडे वी विल डू अ ब्रीफ रिव्यू ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव डन इन आर प्रीवियस लेक्चर्स सो इन द प्रीवियस लेक्चर्स इफ यू रिमेंबर वी हैव स्टार्टेड द कार्नो साइकिल सो विच वाज एस फॉलोस दिस इज माय पीवी प्लेन सो वी हैड अ गैस वी हैड अ गैस एट से so this was our guess at some point a and then what we did was we isothermally expanded the gas to some point b and what we did was we had this piston a kind a piston which had some ideal gas and it had some weights on it so to go from a to b which is an isothermal process we removed out some grains of sand and we kept this on a reservoir of temperature t1 so as we move, removed the grains the pressure decreased the volume increased and some heat was supplied into the gas so some heat q1 was given into the system from b from point b we adiabatically expanded the gas and adiabatic curves are much steeper and we expanded the gas till we reached point c so for adiabatic process what was done was full this full system was isolated however that means no heat was allowed to leave the gas and no heat was allowed to get into the gas so the full system was isolated and at point c the temperature of the system happened to be t2 along this it was t1 so in this in the isothermal expansion it was t1 after the adiabatic expansion it is T2. And next, what we did was we isothermally compressed the gas. We isothermally compressed the gas. So we went from C to point D. So what we did was the same piston, same gas, which was at point C. What we did was we added some grains in. We increased the pressure and we decreased the volume. And while doing this, we kept this on a reservoir of temperature T two, such that heat was rejected into the reservoir. So the heat that was rejected in this case was Q two. And then from point T, we adiabatically compressed the gas to reach the point A. So if we had to draw a schematic of this, the schematic would have looked something like this. Like this. Reservoir at temperature T one. We have a reservoir at temperature T two. we have the kano engine so q1 amount of heat was taken in some work was done and q2 amount of heat was rejected and the work done was equal to q1 minus q2 and this process that we have here which goes along this path is what we call as a cyclic process that is the gas comes back to the starting point and every and we can do this n number of times and we will always reach the starting point so this is a cycle and such processes are called cyclic processes now the work done from the schematic was q1 minus q2 and the work done in this process a b c d a from the pv diagram is nothing but we know that as we have seen earlier is nothing but the area under this curve so the work done is nothing but area under the curve now we define for an engine something called its efficiency and efficiency we are defined as the work that we get divided by the amount of heat that we gave in and if we substitute for the work done from the kano engine we get this as equal to 1 minus q2 by q1 this equation is true for any engine whether it is a kano engine a petrol engine or diesel engine or steam engine so this equation is valid for any type of an engine and another thing that we noticed in our previous lectures was was that the efficiency can never be 100% the reason why this is not possible is because we can't have an engine which doesn't give out any heat so if efficiency has to be 100% the heat that is rejected must be zero which in practical sense is not possible if you recollect we had 
found out the efficiency from the PV diagram and we had found out the values for Q2 and Q1. And the values of Q2 and Q1 was nothing but the area under the curve. So Q1 was the area under AB and Q2 was area under D and C. And if you look back in the previous lectures, the area under this is nothing but the work that we do. So this was, so eta is equal to Q2 minus Q1. And as we have done in our previous lectures, if we substitute for this as the areas under the curve, that is the work done for this isothermal processes, we get this as 1 minus N R T2 ln Vb by Va divided by N R T1 ln Vc by Vb. Now remember this we had calculated for the Carnot engine or Carnot cycle which is a reversible cycle. And from the adiabatic curves BC and AD we proved that at a, Vb divided by Va is equal to Vc divided by Vb. And these terms gets cancelled and other terms also which are constant gets cancelled and what we get is 1 minus T2 by T1. So we found that the efficiency is equal to 1 minus T2 by T1. This was the efficiency of a Carnot engine. And the efficiency of this just depends on the temperature of the reservoirs. Now I will show you all why no engine can be better than a Carnot engine. I will write it down. No engine. What I mean by this is no engine can be more efficient than the Carnot engine. So we cannot have an engine which is more efficient for than a Carnot engine. So we will prove this now. And let us consider a Carnot engine. Let us consider a Carnot engine which operates between two reservoirs. Let's say this is a temp hot temperature, this is a cold temperature. So we have a Carnot engine here. Let's say a Carnot engine takes around 100 joules of heat from the hot reservoir, gives out 20 joules of work and rejects 80 joules of heat. Let's say you have designed an engine Let's say you have designed an engine, let's call it your engine as Y. So you have designed an engine which takes in 100 joules of heat, gives out 40 joules of work and rejects 60 joules of heat. So this is your engine which you claim to be more efficient than the Carnot engine. So now what I do is I run this both the engines together. I do the following. So I have my reservoir TH, the hot reservoir and I have the cold reservoir. And let's say I run your engine which you claim to be more efficient than the Carnot engine. So your engine takes 100 joules of heat, gives out 40 joules of work and rejects 60 joules of heat. So I described a Carnot engine earlier which takes in 100 joules of heat, 20 joules is done given as work and 80 joules is rejected into the cold reservoir. So this being a Carnot engine, we can run this engine backwards. Now what, so what I do is, I make this engine twice the size, that is I double it up. So if I double this up, what this engine will do is, so it will take 200 joules, joules of energy. Now my Carnot engine is two times the initial one. It will give out 40 joules of work and it will reject 160 joules of energy. So what I have done is I have just increased the size of the engine but the efficiency of the engine remains the same. If you calculate the efficiency it will remain the same. So now what I have done is I have increased the size of this engine and made it two times larger than what it was which is this and now I run this engine backwards that is as a refrigerator. So I run my two times Carnot engine in this system. So what I do is whatever work is given out by your engine I give it into my Carnot engine. So if 40 joules of work is given to the Carnot engine so what my Carnot engine does is it takes in 160 joules of heat from the cold reservoir and rejects 200 joules of heat to the hot reservoir. Now let us just ignore this engines for a moment. It's 100 joules 
of heat is given out from the hot reservoir and 200 joules of heat is given into the hot reservoir. So net heat in the system is 100 joules is going up. Similarly, look at this system. So 60 joules is going inside the cold reservoir and 160 joules is going out of going out of the cold reservoir. So what this means is 100 joules is going out. The output of this engine, the final output of this engine is this. So you take 100 joules of heat from the cold reservoir to a hot reservoir and we all know from the second law of thermodynamics that this is not allowed. This is not allowed. So this proves that you cannot have an engine which is better than a Carnot engine. So your claim of having a more efficient engine than the Carnot engine is false. It's not possible. So now let us consider a Carnot engine again, a Carnot cycle again. The efficiency of this Carnot engine or Carnot cycle is Q1 minus Q2 by Q1. And since it's reversible, we saw that for a Carnot engine, efficiency is also equal to 1 minus T2 by T1. So what we see here, if we equate these two terms, I can cancel these terms and I can rearrange this and I can get Q2 by Q1 is equal to T2 by T1 and if I rearrange it further I can get some ratios that is Q1 by T1 equals to Q2 by T2. Let me call this equation 1. So what we see from this equation is the ratio of heat by temperature in process AB that is the isothermal expansion is equal to the ratio of heat by temperature of process DC which is isothermal compression. Now let us find the ratios of heat by temperature for all of these processes. So the process, first process is the isothermal expansion AB. So the heat that is given into the gas is Q1 and the temperature is T1. Then the next process is BC. Now we know that for adiabatic processes there is no heat exchange. So that means this term the ratio of heat by temperature is 0. The third process is CD that is adiabatic compression and the heat that is given is given out is Q2 and the temperature happens to be T2. Now in this case heat is given out that is heat is removed from the gas. Hence we write it with a negative sign. Whereas for adiabatic expansion heat was given into the system that is into the gas. So that's the reason why so whatever is going into the system we can take it to be positive and whatever is going out of the system we take it to be negative and the, and the fourth process DA is adiabatic compression again in adiabatic there is no exchange of heat so this is equal to zero and now from equation one what we have seen is the ratios of heat by temperature are equal. So from equation 1 we see that this is equal to 0. So what we conclude is the heat that I take in any of the process let's say let's say in this process so I name the process as I. So heat taken in or heat rejected any of the processes or any of the stage of this engine divided by the temperature at which that the process occurs if I sum up all the heat inputs and the temperatures at each of the processes this sum is equal to zero and this is an important result and in this we take delta qi to be positive if heat goes into the system and delta qi is negative if heat is rejected of the system. Now this result that we have just got is a very important result. This result is the heart of the whole entropy concept. Before we move on to the concept of entropy, let us discuss uh, some quantities which are state variables and which are not. So we all know that energy, pressure, volume are state variable. That is if I define a gas to be in this state, go around and I come back to the original initial position, I go around and I come back to the initial position, I can show that the change in internal energy happens to be zero. 
The change in the pressure also happens to be zero and the change in the volume also happens to be zero. So at this point, the gas, no matter what part it has taken, will have no change in its internal energy, no change in its pressure and no change in its volume. And such variables is what we call as state variables. So now, if this was my initial position, I go along some path and I come back to the same position. What I've done is, I've done some work. And work done is nothing but area under this curve. And since I have come back to the same position, my internal energy in this case happens to be zero. My change in internal energy is zero. So that means from the first law of thermodynamics that whatever work that I have done equal to the heat that I give to the system. So let us consider initially when the gas was here, it had, its heat was zero. The amount of heat in the gas was zero. And after I go along this path, the gas is at same position but the heat is no longer zero because the work which is done is nothing but equal to the heat that is given into the system. So this shows that heat, heat and work are not state variables. But you should remember that, that the sum of work and the sum of heat is a state variable because it gives us the internal energy. But individually these two are not state variables. So what we see from this is that the energy is a state variable and heat is not a state variable. But there is a new unique quantity which we defined as S and we call it as entropy. Define change in entropy as the heat that you add to the system divided by the temperature in that process. So this quantity that we have derived here is nothing but the quantity that we call as entropy. So entropy is a purely mathematical concept. So what it means is, so if we track, so if we track all the changes, that is all the changes in this process is that is the ratio of heat by temperature. So for a Carnot engine, if we track all the changes in heat, ratio of changes in heat by temperature, what we get is the sum of the change in entropy. And this happens to be zero. So this is what we got for a Carnot engine. And we have seen that for adiabatic process, there is no amount of heat given into the system. So for adiabatic processes, for adiabatic processes, delta S, that is the change in entropy, is equal to zero. So what we see is that entropy is a state variable. So just as change in internal energy, change in pressure, change in volume, depends on where you are on the PV diagram. Same way, delta S is also a state variable. So let us say I have a gas which is initially in state 1 and after some time it is in state 2. So it has gone from 1 to 2 in my PV plane. What is the change in entropy that is delta S in going from 1 to 2? That entropy is a state variable. So that means it is independent of the path that we take. So it doesn't matter if we go from 1 to 2 in this fashion or we go from 1 to 2 in some other fashion, something suppose like this. So the entropy only depends on the state of the gas, that is the initial state of the gas and the final state of the gas. It doesn't depend on what path you have taken. So if I want to find what is the change in entropy to going from 1 to 2, what I can do is I can consider some reversible process, for example, uh, isothermal process I can consider small small isothermal expansions and each of these small isothermal expansion let's say dq amount of heat is given in and t is the temperature at each isothermal expansion and if in a mathematical limit I can take all these small small heat inputs and temperature and I can integrate it from point 1 to 2 so in the mathematical limit, these isothermal expansions will be very very small and we get the change in entropy is nothing but integral of the ratios of dq by t. That delta s, that is the change in entropy is a state variable and it only depends on the state of a gas, that is the initial state of the gas and the final state of the gas. It doesn't depend on the path that you take. The units of entropy, we take them as to be joule per Kelvin as we see, of, see from here. Unit of heat is joules and unit of temperature is Kelvin. Before we proceed to understand entropy in more detail, let us take some problems. To this problem, 
we will see that that a change in entropy is indeed independent of the path it takes so let us consider an ideal gas which is initially in this position at 1 and its final position is 2 so the gas goes from 1 to 2 so in the first process let us consider the gas goes the ideal gas goes from 1 to 2 in an isothermal process so isothermal process is a process where the temperature is constant so let's say the temperature in this process was t our aim is to find what is the change in entropy when the gas goes in the isothermal process so the change in entropy is nothing but the difference of entropies between these two states of the gas that is entropy at state 2 minus entropy at state 1 we already know that that a change in entropy is nothing but sum of all the ratios of heat divided by the temperature so we sum up all the heat divided by the temperature in this process now in this process from the first law of thermodynamics which is delta q equals delta u plus delta w since this is an isothermal process the change in internal energy is zero because the temperature is constant so in this process delta q equals delta w and the work done is nothing but p times delta v so replacing delta q by this we get p delta v by t and since this is an ideal gas from the ideal gas law we know that pv is equal to nrt so replacing p with this term we get n r d v by v so t and t gets cancelled now in this case we consider infinitesimally many many small small processes so since we are considering infinitesimally small processes our submission we take it as to be an integral and a volume goes from at point 1 a volume was v1 at point 2 a volume is v2 so the limits are from v1 to v2 so from this we get the change in entropy in going from 1 to 2 to be equal to nr ln v2 by v1 so this is a change in entropy along an isothermal path now to show that the change in entropy of the gas is independent of path i will go along a different process let us say we go along this path we go from this point to this point where the volume is constant and from this point to this point so let me call this point as point number three so i go along one two three as an isochoric process and i go along three to two as an isobaric process so the change in entropy is nothing but the entropy the change in entropy in going from one to three plus the change in entropy in going from 3 to 2 now let us find what is the change in entropy in going from 1 to 3 so to find delta s 1 to 3 so as we have already defined the entropy entropy is nothing but integral of dq by t so we are taking infinitesimally small small processes so ratio of each processes so the heat input divided by the temperature from first law of thermodynamics we know that dq equals du plus dw so we replace this term with this on the first law of thermodynamics so from this we get delta s is equal to du by t plus integral of dw by t if you look here this, this process is an isochoric process that means the volume is constant and we have already learned that for a constant volume and we have already learned that for a constant volume du that is the internal energy is equal to n times the specific heat at constant volume times dt and the work done for an isochoric process is nothing but the area under the curve and in this case the area under the curve is zero so the work done is equal to zero so from this so substituting this in our equation we get delta s equals integral of n c dt divided by t plus zero since dw is zero and the integral of this is so let's say at point 1 a temperature was t1 and at point 3 a temperature was t3 
so the limits of temperature is t1 to t3 and from this we get delta s and from this we get delta s equals to ncv log of t3 by t1 so this is a change in enthalpy in going from 1 to 3 now let us find out the change in enthalpy in going from 3 to 2 the change in enthalpy in going from 3 to 2 is equal to integral of dq by t and in this case if you notice in the pv diagram this process the pressure is constant that is it's an isobaric process now if the pressure is constant in this case dq is equal to n times cp dt so this we have already studied in the previous lectures so substituting this in the above equation we get change in enthalpy is equal to n times cp dt by t and the limits in this case is at point 3 the temperature is t3 at point 2 let us consider the temperature to be t2 so the limits are t3 to t2 and this equals n times cp t2 by t3 another relation that we have already studied is that cp the specific at constant pressure is equal to the specific at constant volume plus the gas constant r so using this in this equation we get the change in enthalpy as n times cv log of t2 by 3 3 plus n times r log of t2 by t3 so this is a change in enthalpy from so this is a change in enthalpy going from 3 to 2 so now a net change in enthalpy is equal to a change in enthalpy in going from 1 to 3 1 to 3 plus a change in enthalpy in going from 3 to 2 and both these values we have already found out so the change in enthalpy in going from 1 to 3 is equal to n times cv log of t3 by t1 and now change in enthalpy to go from 3 to 2 is nothing but this value so plus ncv ln t2 by t3 plus nr ln t2 by t3 now using properties of log and taking cv and n common the change in enthalpy equals n cv ln t3 by t1 into t2 by t3 plus this term nr ln t2 by t3 if you look at this term t3 and t3 gets cancelled so from the pv diagram we see that the initial state and final state since they lie along an isothermal process they happen to have the same temperature that is t1 is equal to t2 so since t1 n is equal to t2 this term becomes 1 and log of 1 is equal to 0 so a change in enthalpy so a change in enthalpy so a change in enthalpy equals nr ln t2 by t3 since the gas in this process is an ideal gas we can use pv is equal to nrt and we can write t as pv divided by nr so instead of t2 and t3 we can substitute it as follows we can substitute t2 to be equal to p2 v2 by nr and t3 to be equal to p3 v3 by nr and from a pv diagram we see that the pressure at point 2 and pressure at point 3 is equal so that means p3 is equal to p2 and the volume at point 1 and point 3 is equal to v1 so this becomes v1 so now substituting this in this equation we get change in enthalpy is equal to nr ln v2 by v1 so this is a change in enthalpy when we go along the path 1 3 2 so what we see is the change in enthalpy that we calculated when we went along this path 1 2 we got it to be this and we went along this path 1 3 2 we got it to be this and the values in both the cases happen to be the same so this shows that enthalpy is independent of the path that we take 
So before I introduce the second law of thermodynamics, I told all that there are some processes which are perfectly valid in nature, but they don't seem to happen. So they do not violate any law. They do not violate the law of conservation of energy, nor do they violate any Newton's laws. For example, we had taken this process where we push a wooden block along a frictional surface and what we see is the wooden block loses its energy and it comes to a halt and it has heated up. Now if I take a video of this and I play the movie backwards, what I notice is the block loses its energy and it starts moving along. But we all know that such a process won't happen in nature, that is a reverse process won't happen in nature. And then we had concluded that, that we need a law that will tell us what is allowed and what is not allowed. And now we are ready to define the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe must always be greater than or equal to zero. This is our second law of thermodynamics. So what this tells us is if we take any process and if at the end of the process the change in entropy, the change in entropy is larger then the process will happen. If it is smaller than before then the process won't happen. If you remember I had also given you an example of an egg dropping from my hand. So an egg drops from my hand and it splatters all on the floor. But if I take a video of it what we see is the splattered egg combines to form a full egg and it comes and sits in my hand. But we all know that such a process won't happen. So the reason why it won't happen is so when the egg falls from my hand and splatters of the flow the change in entropy is greater than zero. But in the reverse process where the splattered egg combines to form a full egg and comes and sits in my hand it shows that the entropy of that system has decreased and which is not allowed as per the second law. So now we will take some examples of the second law and try to understand it in more detail. Let us take an example where we have two reservoirs, one it has a higher temperature and one it has a colder temperature. And I take some amount of heat from the hot reservoir, let's say Q amount of heat I take it from the hot reservoir and I dump it into the cold reservoir. And what is the entropy, change in entropy in this process? So the change in entropy as we have already done this before is equal to the heat output divided by the temperature. So in this case the heat that is given out by the hot reservoir is Q and since it is leaving the system we write it as minus Q divided by the temperature of the reservoir plus is the heat gained by the cold reservoir. So heat gained by the cold reservoir we write it as positive. So positive Q divided by the temperature of the cold reservoir. Now if you look at this equation you look at this equation, in both these equations Q has the same value. But what is different is the temperature of the reservoir. Now we know that the temperature of a higher reservoir is greater and the temperature of the lower reservoir is less. So that means this ratio will be less than this. Hence the change in entropy in this case will be greater than zero. Since this term, the negative term is less than the positive term. Since this is greater than zero as per second law of thermodynamics, this process is allowed. Now consider a reverse process. We have Th and we have Tc. And let's say we take Q amount of heat from Tc and we dump it into the higher reservoir. So this is what our Carnot law tells us that we cannot have an engine whose sole effect is to take heat from the cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. And I will prove this in the form of entropy. In this case the change in entropy is the heat rejected by the cold reservoir. So the heat rejected is Q and since it is rejected is minus Q. So the heat rejected divided by the temperature plus the heat gained by the hot reservoir. So in this case heat is gained so plus Q divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. Now as seen in the previous case, this term Th is larger than Tc. Hence this quantity will be less. So that means this ratio will be less than this ratio. And since this is negative, the final answer will be less than zero, that is negative. So this process since it is negative as per the second law of thermodynamics, this is not allowed. 
So in any process, if the change in entropy is negative, that is the change of entropy of the universe is less than zero, the process will not happen. And if the change in entropy of the universe is greater than zero, the process will happen. Let us take another example of change in entropy. Let us consider I have one liter of water in a beaker, one liter of water in a beaker which is at 80 degrees centigrade and I have another beaker with one liter of water at 20 degrees centigrade. So if I mix both of this, I put both of them in a beaker, what I notice is I have two liters of water and both of them have reached to a final temperature and the final temperature is Tc plus Th divided by 2. Let's say this is Tc and this is Th and if I plug in the values I get my final temperature is equal to 50 degrees centigrade. The change in entropy in this case is nothing but we have hot water which was at 80 degrees centigrade and we had cold water which was at 20 degrees centigrade and what happens is when we mix both of this the hot water will lose some of its energy and reach over here that is the final state final temperature state 50 degrees and the cold water will gain the energy and reach to the final state so this thing will lose q amount of energy and this thing will gain some q amount of heat so the change in entropy will be equal to the change in entropy for the hot water plus the change in entropy of the cold water and this is equal to again we consider the process to be infinitesimally small so this is equal to dq by t plus again this also is equal to dq by t and we know that dq is equal to we have already done this dq is equal to n m times the mass of the substance into its specific heat into the change in temperature so we had defined dq as this so replacing this dq by this equation we get mass of the water into the specific heat divided by t dt plus mass of the water specific heat dt divided by t now we know that the mass of the water in both the cases is same since both of them have the same volume 1 liter also since both the liquids are water the specific heat of both is the same now what are the limits for the temperature we see that for the hot water this was for hot the temperature goes from 80 degrees to the final temperature it goes from th to tf and for the cold water the temperature goes from tc to tf so from tc to tf so now integrating this we get so whatever is common so m and c are common so i take it out and i put a bracket so integrating the above equation we get ln tf by th plus ln tf by tc now plugging in the values we get the mass of 1 liter of water is equal to 1000 grams specific rate of water we know is 1 calorie we can also do this calculation in terms of joules doesn't matter and this temperature is we convert it into kelvin so 50 degrees centigrade will be 323 kelvin divided by 293 plus log of 323 divided by 353 so converting all the given temperatures in terms of kelvin so calculating this we get change in entropy is 8.66 calories per day per kelvin per kelvin now if you want to convert this into joules you have to just multiply 4.184 with this and in joules the answer is 36.25 joule per kelvin if I had to make a video of this experiment where I add 1 liter of water at 80 degrees centigrade and 1 liter of water at 20 degrees centigrade and, and where I observe that once I put them in the container both of them attain a temperature of 50 degrees and if we had to play the video backwards what we would have seen is that the water which was initially at 50 degrees centigrade separates into two parts where one liter becomes 80 degrees centigrade and another part becomes 20 degrees centigrade now if this process had to occur and if we had to calculate its entropy the entropy would have been minus 36.25 and as per the second law of thermodynamics we know that the entropy of the universe cannot be less than zero 
Uh, since in this process, in the backward video, in this process, the entropy change in entropy is negative. It violates the second law of thermodynamics. So that's the reason why it won't happen in nature. 